Hello everyone. Uh, so welcome to this introductory lecture on advanced blockchain technology CS762. Uh, so most of you have probably already taken uh, CS765. It's a prerequisite. Uh, so you should have taken that course if you want to do this one. So you'd be expected to know the basics of uh, blockchains, everything covered in uh, CS765. Right? So uh, since we haven't yet decided whether uh, which classes are going to be online or offline and classrooms haven't been assigned, so there's no location as such for this course. Uh, so we'll start out online and uh, depending on uh, whether uh, everybody comes to campus or not, we might have some offline uh, classes. Uh, it's possible that we may have to have all lectures online but at least uh, live sessions we may actually have in-person ones, you know, if there's a significant number of students on campus. So we have been assigned slot 1 which has uh, these slots shown over here. Uh, it was uh, I believe the same slot for CS765 last semester. Uh, so we'll see, maybe we can continue the same thing of having live sessions on Thursdays, uh, right, uh, if it's convenient for everyone. So this is a web page I've created for the class. Uh, I'll uh, put the link on Moodle whenever it, whenever the Moodle web page is set up, right? And uh, uh, before we get to the actual material of the course, maybe let's talk a little bit about the mark structure and so on. So uh, the number of students in this class is, you know, it's quite large. So we can't have uh, too many evaluation methods and so on. So we'll have uh, two exams, midterm and final exam. And uh, these que the questions for these exams will be set based on the class material, whatever is covered in class. So we will be looking at uh, some of the more uh, recent papers in blockchains and look, look more deeper into things. You know, so we had looked at, for example, Satoshi's analysis. But uh, Satoshi's analysis of his own blockchain and attacks and so on. But what happens if you have a general sort of an attack? What what analysis can be done then? Right. So we look look at things in a more uh, deeper fashion. Uh, also, we look at uh, things like advanced proof of stake uh, algorithms. I just talk about that in a moment. So anyway, we'll have two exams covering about fifty percent, but a large evaluation component will be your project. So what is this project? So the project will be proposed by you. Uh, so this is uh, typically how co advanced courses are handled in the US, advanced research courses. So you will form teams of three students each, right? at most three students. Of course, the, if you want to do it alone too, you can do it. And you will have to propose a course project. So suppose you were uh, writing a grant proposal, for example, you became a faculty member somewhere, right? You would have to write a proposal and the proposal would have to say things like, uh, what is, what are the objectives, what do you hope to achieve, right? And in a research project, you're never really sure what, uh, I mean, you can never be sure that you will actually achieve all those uh, particular goals, right? But but you tentatively say that these are the topics I want to study, uh, this is what I want to do, right? So, so maybe uh, I've suggested some topics here, these are the same ones which we'll be covering in the course. But you could read up some research papers. Uh, I, I will suggest some of the top conferences where you can actually look up what has been published recently. Right? And you may want to read up as a team, right? Team of three students, maybe each of you reads three papers, that would mean nine papers, right? And you get an idea, maybe this is uh, something that interests me, this is what I want to look at further. Right? And uh, uh, what exactly you do is up to you, and the more uh, ambitious you are, I mean, the better the marks you're going to get, right? So, I, so already in the previous course, you have built things like a simulator, you know, on, on your own. Uh, you've written smart contracts and things like that. So. So you can do anything interesting, right? So, 
blockchain is a very diverse topic actually it's almost like an its own internet now right but with its own layers and so on so we we are focusing on the lower layers mainly on things like consensus and the network and so on right but but also there is a lot of work being done at the higher layers at the smart contract layer and so on right uh, some people are looking at attacks even on the smart contract layer right so there are various scams and other things happening because there's so much of money involved and there's very little regulation right so you can have a project which looks at the typical layers we look at like the consensus layer or something at the network layer maybe some attacks and so on but you can also look at higher layers like uh, uh, like i suggested at the smart contract layer and so on right or you could even do things like looking at uh, just the blockchain data out there there's a whole bitcoin data there's a whole ethereum blockchain out there right and in fact for any other blockchain uh, most of these many of these are publicly available uh, right all the permissionless ones are public so you could analyze them to to study something interesting uh, right what that is of course you will have to figure out right so the topics that i have suggested are scalability of blockchains how to increase the throughput and computation fast consensus things like algorand uh, right privacy in blockchains uh, we've studied a little bit about that last time and when we talked about anonymity and so on we've also studied about payment channel networks right so uh, uh, things like lightning network Uh, so all of this is work in progress right and uh, you i mean there's lots of research papers coming out uh, so you may not be able to do as much work as let's say which is done in a typical research paper i mean you could also and uh, some of this work if you do if it's good enough to be published then why not publish it right but but uh, you never know you you can be ambitious and try out something maybe you want to do some theoretical work or maybe you want to simulate something right or or maybe you want to actually build something uh, some particular uh, it, it's you want to go beyond simulations you actually want to implement something right or it could be analysis of just uh, analysis of blockchain data which is out there right so uh, since this there's 50 marks given for the project uh, you should put in a fair amount of effort Uh, right and uh, uh, i'm following the pattern uh, that was done for advanced course which i took when i was a graduate student in the us right so so this this sort of a uh, out i have this sort of schedule is followed even when we submit proposals uh, you know for research grant so initially of course we have a proposal but then we have to submit progress reports every so often right and uh, whoever is uh, funding the research they would want to know what progress we made of, of course that's not every few uh, weeks as as i've shown over here but every few months that's what would be done right just to make sure that we are making progress and we get some feedback and so so what i would expect you to do is to use a latex style file which uh, Uh, somebody had actually given to me you find it on this particular uh, web page and i would like you to use that uh, latex style file for all the reports that you submit so first of all i would want a proposal that should uh, tell me who is the project team so please uh, decide carefully about your project team i would like the team to stay together throughout the semester right it shouldn't be that you have uh, split up like like our many of our politicians right they join together to form a coalition and then they ditch each other in between right and uh, co form a coalition with somebody else so that shouldn't happen i would ex- expect the team to be the same throughout but in this proposal you would have to uh, tell me what are the objectives you would have to give me a tentative timeline so maybe the objectives are that you want to simulate something that you've seen in a particular research paper right uh, or you want to study a particular topic but but how are you going to study it right are you uh, are you going to do analysis theoretical analysis are you going to do uh, 
uh, simulations or even to emulate something right those objectives should be given uh, you can be ambitious uh, in, as to what you want to achieve and have a tentative timeline about what you are going to complete by when right so so i am giving about 3 weeks for you to uh, submit the proposal and uh, that's a fair amount of time so you better start right away because uh, you need to have a good idea of what you are going to propose spend the first 3 weeks uh, discussing with each other reading up some papers and uh, decide on this uh, as to what you are going to do for the project right I, in the, I mean it you could always tweak the project later on and say that I want to change what I want to do a little bit more I mean a little bit later but but ideally it's good if you in within the first three weeks decide what you want okay and then you would have to submit uh, progress reports every so often right one progress report in February one in uh, March and the final report I would want you to submit by the end of the semester uh, right which is, I think the last date of class is around 15th of April so a little bit before that if you submit your final rep report right and uh, I would like to see some demo from you right if uh, if at all you are building something right so uh, uh, in addition to uh, a report uh, I would like you to make a presentation which other students in the class can see and appreciate what work you have done right so uh, it shouldn't be that I am the only one who gets to see what what's there in your project but others too should uh, get the benefit and uh, let's do recorded presentations we, we won't have enough time probably in class to do live presentation let's see uh, but anyway for now let's plan that you record a presentation just like I am giving now and in fact in most conferences too nowadays which they, they happen to be online uh, so people just record their talks and upload and you know and uh, maybe uh, uh, some of them actually have a question and answer session where the whoever is presenting is available for, for live question and answer session right but but anyway you can record your talk let's say the talk is about uh, 30 minutes uh, right it's a fair amount of time so you'll have to present your work i mean since it's recorded you can be quite efficient you can make slides and so on you have to present maybe some background material uh, because not everybody would might know what you're doing right so you'd have to give an introduction to the topic of your project what exactly you are looking at uh, maybe you explain some background material and then you go into what you actually did right and what you actually found out right so uh, so all of these have marks allotted to them and uh, total is 50 marks right so it's a big percentage of what you want to uh, big percentage of the total marks for the semester Okay, so that's a little bit about the evaluation scheme and uh, let's talk a little bit about these topics. Uh, so blockchain is a very wide area, it's an exploding research area, lots of people in academia too have jumped into the ring, you know, and there's a huge amount of money, right, in uh, blockchains now. It wasn't the case, let's say, if even five years back so I got interested in blockchains in 2015 and uh, uh, not as a researcher but just curious I started teaching blockchain in 2017 January right so but a uh, little one and a half years before that I got interested and it wasn't so big in the academic community then a uh, few people had talked about it I had heard somebody giving a talk but there was just Bitcoin and Ethereum had just sort of come out. Nobody sort of was sure where it would go, right? Uh, so, but of course now things have changed and uh, because just the market cap of these blockchains are trillions of dollars and it might go up 
even 10x, you know, you never know, might become tens of trillions soon, or it may go down by a factor of 10, you never know how things are going to go. Right? But because there is a lot of, uh, a lot of things happening in blockchain, a lot of academics too have jumped in. Right? So there are full conferences on blockchains nowadays. Uh, maybe in the past two, three years they've come about, but also the traditional conferences in various fields are accepting research papers in blockchain. So the types of topics we, people look at are very diverse and uh, in this course I am looking at the topics that I am interested in. I mean there's no, it, it's not that these are the only topics out there. There could be lots of things uh, which we won't be covering. Right? So this is an advanced course and we look at just a few issues. So one of the topics is scalability and uh, what exactly is the problem here? Well you know that Bitcoin generates blocks every 10 minutes. And each block is of size of hardly 1 MB right? and this translates to roughly 7 transactions per second. So this is hardly anything right? and uh, the question is can you push more transactions onto the blockchain right? and it's a non-trivial problem to solve because if you reduce this block interval then you may have more forking and uh, that makes it problematic because uh, it actually gives an attacker an advantage if he wants to do a double spend attack for example because uh, some of the hashing power gets split uh, when you have let's say a fork you know if you instead of having a single blockchain you have something like this then even if the number of blocks generated are large they are not in a chain they are sort of spread out across this tree so the longest chain is much smaller than the total number of blocks right? and an attacker might be able to generate a chain longer than the longest chain here. Right? Anyway, we we'll look at this in detail later on in the course but forking is not good. You want to avoid forking which is why Satoshi kept it to 10 minutes. And if you increase the block size too you can actually have more forking because it will take this block longer to actually progress to propagate in the network right? because every miner will verify a block before actually forwarding it to the next miner and so on. So scalability is non-trivial and we looked at solutions like Lightning Network which are doing uh, transactions off-chain right? but Lightning Network has its own shortcomings when we look at Lightning Network in more detail in the course we'll see that. Uh, Lightning Network is not a solution to all problems, right? Uh, uh, I mean, it has its own issues. And anyway, you need this main blockchain in order to get something like the Lightning Network up and running, right? You have to do some sort of a funding transaction. You might want to quit from the payment channel and so on by sending transactions. So you need the main blockchain. So you, we would like to increase the number of transactions much beyond this. In, in Bitcoin right? and the question is how to do that right so uh, number of transactions per second we want to increase there is also the issue of computation which is somewhat related to this but not exactly the same uh, so even if I have the number of transactions let's say seven transactions per second can I have a heavy computation in every transaction and uh, there may be certain applications where you want to do this. For example, you're doing some heavy cryptography for you, you know, in some application. And uh, let's say that a particular transaction, it's not just a simple payment from A to B, but it's running a heavy smart contract, let's say in Ethereum. Okay? And it turns out that you can't do heavy computation even in today's uh, Ethereum. You want, uh, you want the gas limit to be quite small and if you recall maybe from your third assignment in the last semester uh, what this gas is so you have to limit how much computation is there in each transaction and that's given by this gas limit. 
so the gas limit is quite small and because if you increase the gas limit it creates more issues there are various things like the verifiers dilemma we'll study this when we talk about computational scalability we'll talk more about this but uh, if uh, essentially what you want every particular miner to do is you want him to validate each and every block before creating the next one but it turns out that if you increase the computation in each block he might be tempted to mine on a block even without verifying it you know just because he doesn't want to waste a lot of time uh, before starting mining of the next block anyway so there are various issues with increasing the gas and uh, this is the issue of computational scalability so can i increase the gas limit so the gas limit of a transaction of a single transaction or even of a block okay this is an issue which uh, sort of our research group you can say is one of the leaders uh, globally so we have some good papers i'd be talking about them so one was yoda which was published in ndss 2019 so ndss is one of the top conferences in security okay so that the big four yes like you have grand slams in tennis right you have big four conference in security one is ccs uh right i triple e snp security and privacy right ndss network and distributed system security and uh, the fourth one is usenix security right so it's uh, quite uh, it's a big deal to get into these top four conferences they are quite uh, restrictive in which papers they accept right and we had we were one of the first people who from when i was still at iit delhi at that time uh, well of course i was here as a visitor in 2018 but anyway uh, we we got a paper that we were among the first people to look at this computational scalability where we said that uh, the miners don't themselves do the computation they offload it to sort of another group of people a group of volunteers but then the trick is how do the miners know that what computation these people have done is correct or not right so that that's what we looked at we came up with a statistical method for a particular uh, threat model right uh, right and uh, more recently we have something called tuxedo which i had announced last semester and this is in sigmetrics so it's sigmetrics would be held on the campus of iit bombay later you know in uh, maybe june 20 2022 but they accept papers throughout the year so our paper will appear over there and uh, sigmetrics is the only it's sort of the top conference in performance so this is for security and every field in computer science has its own sort of uh, top conferences so this is the top one in performance right and uh, the flavor is very different uh, so here in theory you can have any amount of computation in the transaction right in theory your gas limit can be very very large here there are some limits but uh, but but this is sort of like an off chain solution whether by off chain i mean that the miners don't actually do the computation here uh, the miners actually do the computation so i'll be talking about these papers in some detail uh, and uh, 
both of them were spearheaded by a former B.Tech student of mine at IIT Delhi, Saurabh Das. He's now doing his PhD at UIUC, right? And of course, this second one also has a Nitin Avtare as a co-author, who was your TA last semester. So I have done some work also on uh, strengthening these blockchains to make them more uh, secure. So that is another topic we'll be discussing. So Satoshi looked at the double spend attack. And other people wanted to know, can we look at more general attacks and the, the thing is every other day somebody might come out with a different attack right we looked at selfish mining which was somewhat different from the double spend attack so can you prove something general for all types of attacks uh, you know it's, it seems like an ingenious thing that might be impossible to do that's what we would think but it turns out that people have made significant progress and uh, so they they have a particular threat model. So the threat model essentially says what is the adversary's characteristics and what is the adversary allowed to do. So for example, we, we assume that the adversary has less than 50% of the hashing power in the net. Uh, you know, if he has more than 50%, then we are done for, you know, he could do a 51% attack. So we assume something like less than 50%. And what can we prove, you know, and people have shown uh, that essentially you will have a robust proof of work blockchain in those sort of circumstances, you know, they could derive precise results and uh, they do things like showing that if you have two honest miners, let's call them H1 and H2, and this person has seen a particular blockchain at a particular time, let's say at time T1 and this person has seen another blockchain at T2, right? And let's say T2 is greater than T1. You can show that uh, these guys will have a prefix, the prefix of these two blockchains uh, will be the same with very high probability. Okay, and uh, this, let's say, let's call this time as some uh, tau. Okay, so for some tau, let's say this may be a few minutes, let's say, let's say maybe tens of minutes even, uh, from this time T1. It's proving that for any T2 greater than T1, uh, T1 both these honest miners will have the same blockchain up to a particular point in time, T1 minus tau with very high probability. So basically this is saying that uh, suppose I have reached time T1, I can know that most of the blocks in my blockchain are going to be there pretty much forever for all honest people in the blockchain. Right? Of course the attacker can do anything, he can say that I am not mining on this chain or something like that, right? But but at least all honest miners will have pretty much the same chain. So how to prove this for a general threat model is quite uh, intriguing and people have made lots of progress over the years and uh, essentially they've come up with tight results and that they show that if the attacker has less than this much hashing power then uh, with very high probability we are going to have this sort of a result where blocks once deep enough in the chain will remain there forever. Right? And this is just analysis of a general proof of work blockchain, but some of my other students have looked at ways of uh, strengthening or securing these blockchains. Uh, so can we deviate a little bit from a blockchain? Right? So this is what, this is the traditional blockchain. Uh, what can we do interesting over here, right? And you might think, uh, sort of like Satoshi's way of doing it is the only way to, you know, build a blockchain. But uh, one of my students, uh, Ovia is her name, Ovia Sheshadri, she's uh, finishing her PhD right now. So
so she has done some interesting work where uh, uh, we add weight to the blockchain but in addition to the traditional blocks we can do things like adding something called an anchor and here is the idea so while I'm mining for a block right, so we said that let's say this is the target for mining a block right we said if the hash comes less than this then you get a block you can have uh, let's say another t1 over here which is another threshold and if the hash lies within this you can create something called an anchor okay so it's, so this is not extra hashing you're doing the same hashing but you can solve there's an extra puzzle right and this is sort of a standard technique you can do a two for one sort of mining or even three for one and so on right uh, you can create many different things besides blocks so what we do is if you have hash values between t and t1 for a while you are mining you can create something called an anchor which is not part of the main chain so to speak but it will sort of be hanging off a particular block it's sort of like anchoring the block you can say that's why we call it an anchor and the whole weight of this chain is the weight of the blocks plus the weight of the anchors right so you may have since it's a random process different blocks may have different number of anchors and so on right and the question is how secure are these chains so so Ovia did some analysis for this too right so we can try to extend the analysis done for traditional blockchain but for these sorts of things and the idea here is that you're adding weight to the chain much more frequently than you're adding weight than Satoshi was adding weight to his chain, right? So Satoshi generates a block every 10 minutes, but these anchors can be generated every one minute or two minutes and so on, right? And uh, that in theory could make the chain more secure, right? So we have some results, but some things are still not completely clear about how, uh, how this would compare to a traditional blockchain right so scalability is one issue uh, security is another issue uh, right so so besides this uh, there is also a verification of smart contracts So many of you know about the DAO attack, which I think in some live sessions last semester I discussed, where Vitalik Buterin and his gang, right, uh, so they are the Ethereum founders, they had a particular smart contract in Ethereum which uh, had a lot of Ether sort of contributed to it, right, lots of money had been deposited in the smart contract and somebody found a bug and uh, sort of something you would normally skip over some trivial thing uh, but they had overlooked it and uh, that person was uh, siphoning off the money right so he was sort of stealing the money over time and that was a big problem for them they actually had to do a hard fork uh, which is not theoretically not allowed they, even they may not be able to do it today but they anyway did it that was early days in ethereum but the question is what if there are uh, attacks now what is to be done right so can i verify my smart contract before putting it on the blockchain you know and uh, this is where formal verification comes in and uh, one of my colleagues at iit delhi has published some papers again in ndss he published a few years back professor subodh sharma Right. Let me see if I can get him to give a guest lecture for this course. Uh, but uh, but this is a very important topic. Uh, I'm planning to do some joint research with him to uh, this particular semester, right? But but uh, because if somebody puts out uh, you and I, let's say we create a smart contract and we put it out there and it has a bug then uh, that could bring down a whole business right if, if somebody siphons money or uh, you know steals a lot of money and so so what can we do right and uh, there's another angle to this about can we patch smart contracts uh, 
right so ethereum wasn't initially designed for that but if i were building a new blockchain i would want to have that feature in there right uh, of course the the there's a it's a little bit of a tricky situation because you don't want people to change their contract i mean somebody might deposit a million dollars in a smart contract uh, believing the logic over there right and if you let somebody arbitrarily change the contract that's not fair right so you have to have a method for people to change the smart contract but there has to be some fairness also and some people have proposed that we will have a voting mechanism that the miners will vote whether to change a smart contract or not you know somebody can propose a change to to a particular smart contract like just like patching some code right okay so this is one thing that we will look at and uh, another topic to look at is uh, lightning network so we looked at the lightning network where uh, you have payment channels on each edge and somebody can actually pay someone who doesn't have a direct payment channel by connecting through a lot of other people right who who have payment channels with each other right so there are lots of issues over here uh, just in this this is called a layer 2 solution layer 1 is the original blockchain which we want to scale up but lightning network is layer 2 uh, so the one thing is uh, uh, how do you find this path from a to b e? uh, right so th- first of all you want to have some amount of privacy you don't want somebody to know what payments are being made you know because then the government or uh, some bad guy might sort of let's say he control c if he knows that a is paying to e then uh, maybe he can use that information in a negative way right so the lightning network has some privacy built in so that c may not know that a is paying e right Uh, but the privacy creates other problems it may may be hard for a to find a path uh, from a to e right so that there is enough of balance on each of these channels uh, right so i am just saying calling this a b1 b2 c1 c2 d1 d2 yeah so these are the bitcoin balances let's say on each edge of the channel and you want to have if a wants to pay some amount to e then there should be enough ba- balance in a b2 c2 and so on to be able to pay along this path so sometimes it may happen that he he tries out a particular path he knows that there exists a path but he doesn't know what balances are there and but the payment might fail because let's say b2 is less than the amount he wants to pay so there have been lots of papers which try to s- solve this problem you know and uh, newer ones are being proposed uh, some of our students to at iit bombay have proposed some solution we we recently had a paper called rebal by nitin avatare right and uh, it's it, it it there's a little bit of networking to involved over here because you have a lightning network and some amount some amount of routing and so on right and uh, how to solve this problem i mean there are more and more newer and newer solutions coming around and maybe some of you might have some good ideas right so then uh, there is also the issue of privacy in layer 1 privacy on the main blockchain and we saw in the last course that bitcoin is not so anonymous so if, uh, some bad guy is trying to use bitcoin to mess around you know uh, do all sorts of bad things collect ransomware uh, and so on you know uh, so what is ransomware some other students of mine have looked at that issue so ransomware is a malware which just encrypts your files or does some mischief on your desktop and says you pay me so much in, in bitcoin and then i will undo the mischief i have done on your machine right so it's a big problem uh and uh, bitcoin has sort of allowed ransomware to flourish because it's uh, somewhat semi anonymous so ra- people hope that they can get paid in bitcoin without getting caught but that's not true right uh, governments and so on will look at the transaction graph they might even look at where transactions are originating in the network 
and they might try to catch uh, you know the bad guy but there are other things like uh, zcash and so on okay zero cash and so on the, which claim to have more anonymity and uh, they use things like zero knowledge proofs so propose professor manoj pravakaran is an expert in things like zero knowledge proofs they are advanced cryptographic techniques so you want to prove something to somebody but uh, not prove not give out more information than what he is asking for uh, right so it's a it's a tricky thing and it allows gives a lot of privacy uh, so it's something like having a mixer you know we studied mixing last semester but can you have a mixer which is sort of built in to the let's say the protocol itself it's not that you have a third party who's doing mixing for you whom you have to trust the the mixing is done in the cryptography on the blockchain itself right so suppose uh, i i was getting paid let's say this is a let's say this is a bowl and uh, let's say that uh, this is a like i'm just saying that these are coins let's say a b c and d have some bitcoin which i am showing as this or in and this would be it's not bitcoin but it would be the coin for a particular blockchain like used in zcash right and a doesn't want uh, somebody to know which money it is when he's spending it right so he doesn't want to spend this bitcoin so what uh, they do is they all put it put their coins let's say into this particular uh, let's say this particular bowl right i'm just giving you some uh, intuition so some let's say that all these people put put the coin in, coins in right and you but then when a wants to spend uh he is pulling a coin a random coin out of this okay and there sh it should be done in such a way that you cannot connect this coin let's just call it a1 you cannot connect it to a0 over here it's just like mixing right so mixing you put some money into the mixer and you got some money out of the mixer right but here we are doing it uh, not by using bitcoin transactions we are using it doing it using the zero knowledge proofs so a has to be able to prove that in fact his coin was one of the coins put in over here i mean at right there has to be this z proof right because it it can't be that anybody just creates a coin and spends it right he he should have had some coin earlier right and so so this is how it works you sort of put your coins into a bowl and then when people need to spend they pull out the coin and they would have to prove that indeed my coin was in this bowl right and they would have to prove it using some cryptographic technique right and a would not shouldn't be able to spend more than uh, one coin right i mean if he's put in a certain number of coin if he's put in only one coin he should only be able to pull one out right if he's put in five he should only be able to pull five out right so you want to have all of that working and the zero knowledge proof ensures that nobody is able to get more information than uh, the fact that this coin was in this bowl right there is no extra information given out so you cannot connect a1 to a0 right so when a is spending this a1 nobody knows that it is a even if he knows that a was the one who put a0 in here he doesn't know that a is spending it right so it gives some amount of privacy but uh, these use more advanced uh, cryptographic techniques 
so roughly these are the topics i wanted to cover in this course uh, so we will have to look at some research papers uh, in some detail right and uh, of course we won't have to we won't be able to understand each and every point in the paper you know because there could be certain things which are very advanced but at least we should get a reasonable amount uh, we should go to a enough depth in the paper so that we get an idea about what are the basic techniques they are using uh, what what is novel and what are some potential future directions for research right so i hope i have given you an idea about what we will cover in this course and uh, your uh, project which you propose could be on one of these topics or it could be on something different right so so just to give you a list of top level courses uh, top level conferences where blockchain papers are submitted so the, the conferences are not only dedicated to blockchain uh, so the security conferences i mentioned already ccs security and privacy it's sometimes called oakland because it's held in oakland uh, in usa every year nds and usenix right but then there are other top conferences uh, sigmatrix has few blockchain papers uh, two three papers every year there are some conferences heavily geared towards blockchain Uh, this is advances in uh, financial technologies uh, then there is a uh, fnc financial cryptography then uh, there are various other uh, conferences like in distributed systems you have icdcs which has a few uh, blockchain papers so these are conferences which i would consider to be top so aft is a new conference so it's not ranked by the traditional ranking people it, i think they rank them after 5 to 10 years but i'm sure aft might rise up to become like an a, a star conference most uh, most of these are either a or a star right if you want to know what are the ranking um, methods there's something called core it's an australian ranking uh, group you can just look at core ranking right and uh, most of these are a star or a right uh, which are the top ratings given to conferences but then there are other conferences maybe not as highly ranked uh, ieee blockchain and uh, icbc so these are 100% dedicated to blockchains so af no aft i wouldn't say is 100% but uh, i mean a, a big part of the conference is dedicated to blockchains so this is mainly blockchains right so i would say you should look at the past 3 uh, 4 years in these conferences and see if you find anything interesting right so form a team and you you can do some divide and conquer approach among yourselves each of you maybe take a few a uh, few conferences to look at and you can look, look at the abstracts you will have to do a search for blockchain bitcoin and whatever right uh, smart contracts things like that you look for those keywords and see if you find something interesting and uh, you might uh, get some ideas for your project by looking at those papers right the project could do something completely new uh, or it could be an extension of a previous paper or it could be that your uh, 
just verifying something that was done in a paper you know you want to maybe do a deeper analysis than what they have done maybe you do some simulations on your own 